Welcome to Beyond the Next Chapter. I am your host, Whitney Clark. This is our second episode and our first recommendation of the podcast and also our first interview with an author. And I have to be honest with you, I've been looking forward to this for months since we put this on the books. We have Kristen Hanna joining us today. She's one of my absolute favorites. I love historical fiction. She's a number one New York Times bestselling author who's written more than 20 novels including The Nightingale, The Great Alone, and most recently, The Four Winds. Kristen's books are always on all of the lists, and more and more often, her books are getting noticed by Hollywood. You may have seen her novel, Firefly Lane, on Netflix. It was the number one series around the world the week it came out. And now Kristen is joining us to talk about her new book called The Women. Kristen, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Whitney. I'm so honored to be your first author. I love this. Yeah, this is so fun. We are trying to create a space for people to fall in love with books and also hear from their favorite authors like you. Let's talk about the women. How are you? How are you feeling about this project? You know, I, as you point out, I've written a lot of books and, you know, they don't you don't always end up with what you intend to write and some you like better than others. And so this is really, this has been a long time project. It's a, the book of my heart. And so I'm actually really excited to get it out there in the world and, and get people reading it. The Women is such a special story, one that I've never heard before, and I know so many people will be exposed to for the first time. It's a fictionalized version of the very brave women who served as nurses during the Vietnam War, and it details the very divided world and really unique struggles they faced when they returned home. What inspired you to take on these women and this story and this war? Well, so I was a child um, during the Vietnam War, a child to like preteen. And so it cast a really big shadow over my life. Um, you know, I remember the protests. I remember the nightly news. I remember watching my friend's dads, you know, go off to war. And in fact, one of my close girlfriends, her father was a pilot who went to Vietnam and he was shot down. Mm. And um, so back then, and you'll see these in the book, we wore uh, POW bracelets that had the serviceman's name and date on it. So I wore this bracelet for years and years and years. And so his name was always, you know, front and center in my mind. And I knew he never came home. And because of, you know, being such close friends with a military family, I really noticed and saw how the vets were treated when they came home. And that made a lasting impact on me. So I had wanted to write this book uh, for literally two decades. And it wasn't until March of 2020. So Seattle was in lockdown, you know, we were um, closed off. I live in a really small community. There was really nothing to do. And I was seeing on the news how divided the country was. You know, there was so much anger and division and, and political and social discord about COVID and politics and where the country was going and where it should be going. And it just all felt very Vietnam era again to me. It just felt like we were back in that time period again. And then coincidentally, I'm watching the evening news and I'm seeing our healthcare workers, our nurses and our doctors um, really on the front line, sacrificing so much for us and caring for us. And I thought, you know, and getting so little help and, and, um, resources in return. And for some reason, those two things came together at that time and made me think this is the moment that I can write this Vietnam story that I've wanted to write. And I'm going to write about the nurses. How did you first hear about the nurses story and Frankie's story and everything that Frankie went through that so many nurses had also gone through during Vietnam? You know, I never really heard about them in the way that so many courageous women's historical stories are never told. You know, I mean, I knew there had to be nurses in Vietnam. There were nurses in the Civil War. There were nurses in World War II. You know, as long as there have been battlefields, there, I think, have been nurses. 
And so I knew they were there, but beyond, say, China Beach, I didn't really know anything about their story. And so it was really, you know, in March of 2020, when I decided to write this book, I went in search of their story. And what I found were some, I mean, just remarkable women and uh, amazing memoirs and accounts of their service. And, and as interesting to me as their service was, so was their uh their return to America and what it was like in that time period, because these are women um, who, you know, largely came of age in the late 50s, early 60s, a very different world, who had been raised by families that were very military proud about their family's World War II service. And so many of these young women went off to Vietnam um, and, you know, offered to serve their country out of patriotism and you know a consciousness of duty and so here are these young women thrust in this incredibly difficult situation um, without a whole lot of support actually except for how the they band together especially the the women and their friendships and then they come home to a world that is so different than the one they left and their service is not valued and they are not valued and so it was really Frankie's story is really, you know, the DNA of it is the truth of the nurses who served over there. And you just mentioned the female friendships, and that was really a standout part of this story to me. Frankie's friendships with her her two best friends that helped her get through the war and then were there for her anytime she called when she came home. Do you have friendships like that in your own life that you really drew from that help you get by? I absolutely do. I mean, you mentioned Firefly Lane earlier. I have been writing about the power and the impact and the endurance of female friendships, you know, for a long time now. And I think it's because, especially as I get older, I really understand how important and how deep these friendships with women are. Um, and with regard to the women, you know, we've been hearing and seeing and reading about male friendships made during wartime forever. And so I wanted to really explore what that's like for women, because one thing about women is when you make these kind of friends, they last, they stay, they, you know, they continue enduring throughout your life. And so I really wanted to show that, um, I guess in a way I think of Ethel and Barb and Frankie as the true love story of this book, the soulmates that keep each other together. Mm -hmm. I do have to ask you about your research process. Uh, you talked about how you started this in 2020. Run me through how that works, because your books are so rich in detail and very you know, specific stories. Yeah, I mean, it was very daunting to take on um, this historical per period in which I knew so many of my readers would remember, you know, they would be able to know if I was right or wrong. And if I did this book correctly, I really wanted it to get in the hands of the vets, you know, the female and the male vets and their families so that they could perhaps start a dialogue um, that has been long forgotten in this country. And so it was very important to me to get it right and to honor their service and yet to also honor this idea that during that tumultuous time, protest was a patriotic act as well. This is not a simple time where, you know, there's good versus evil. There's a lot of things going on. And so it really was, you know, just a deep dive into not only what I remembered, but what I could research. And the real pay dirt, I felt, was the memoirs of these nurses and some other. There were memoirs of women who fought to bring their husbands home as POWs, um, the League of, of Families. And so there were just a lot of female stories that I was able to pull together to create this narrative that isn't one that we usually see. 
women can be heroes too. That was a big theme of the book and we don't really want to give too much away, but I found myself frustrated for Frankie, that she wasn't being heard, that she came home and she was she was struggling with PTSD, which at the time wasn't as commonplace as it is now. Have you had moments in your life where you kind of felt like that frustration as a woman that you, you weren't being heard similar to Frankie? And you do, you think, do you think that will resonate with a lot of women? Well, yeah. I mean, and and I think the thing that you'll see in this book and in so many of my books, The Four Winds is, is similar. Um, the Nightingale is similar. I really write about women finding their voices, finding their power. And and in the best of circumstances, finding their power and then, you know, pausing to turn and help other women who are still struggling on that journey, because I mean, I think it is a quest for women, you know, and, and when you look at, say, Frankie coming of age in the 50s, when women were really expected to be housewives and quiet and, you know, sort of second to their husbands. I mean, I think it's really important to remind young women that we have voices that matter, that we have things to say, and then collectively that we band together to help each other. Um, because sometimes with women, it can be so difficult to get ahead that you just you're constantly fighting for yourself. And I think it's important to remember the women coming up behind us, too. So I do have to say, and you probably get this a lot, I do cry in all of your books. I'm pretty sure I've cried in all of them in the best way possible because they are so incredibly moving and emotional and you feel like you know these people, like I felt like I knew Frankie and these women. Is it an emotional process for you to put these stories into words? Do you find yourself getting emotional while, while you're writing these books? You know, the, the thing about writing is... Um, the at least for me, the beginning of the process is very cerebral. So it's really about taking all of this research and th synthesizing it and then using my imagination to build this world and to build this character and to put the character through whatever I believe um, is required in her journey to selfhood, basically. And, you know, in the women, obviously, it's a lot. She goes to war. She comes back broken. She falls in love. Um, you know, her, her love stories aren't always exactly as uh, perfect as she hopes they will be. Her, she has trouble getting um, encouragement and pride from her parents. And so she, she feels very lost. So she's going through, you know, all of these difficult things. And... And then at some point, once I've got everything in place and I start then writing how Frankie feels about all of this, that's when it can become a little bit, you know, more difficult for me because I have to access basically my humanity and my my emotions and my own past and, you know, my own um, fears and hopes and all of that. So some of the books make me cry, not all of them. Um, this one definitely did because Frankie is just, I think she's my favorite character of all time. You know, she just grows so much and she fights so hard and she tries so completely to do the right thing. And, and when she doesn't, it's a real fall. And so I really wanted, you know, I kept wanting to, to pick her up and help her out, but she kind of had to fight these fights on her own. That's that's how I felt. I mean, you're reading this and you're cheering for her. You know, you're you're wanting every time she kind of has to take a step back. It's like you're rooting for her. You want Frankie to do well throughout the whole yeah. um, throughout the whole novel. And it really is amazing to see how she is at the very beginning when she goes to Vietnam, even like her clothes and her outfits. I thought that really kind of stood out to me, like how she was dressed at the beginning versus, you know, towards the end where the last thing on her mind was what she looked like in her physical right. uh, presentation. So, I mean, she takes like a summer dress to Vietnam yeah. in case she needs it. You know, I mean, that's that's a perfect example of how completely unprepared she is for what she's getting into. Mm -hmm. 
So we know that this uh, just came out a couple weeks ago or last week that this has been optioned to become a movie. And you have a couple, The Nightingale um, as well, which is, I understand, in production with um, the Fanning sisters, which will be really amazing to see kind of two sisters playing the role of sisters. What is it like for you to see your books on the big screen or at least in production? Well, you know, the whole production thing, it's so it's so fascinating to watch these actors and actresses like take your words and and run with it and, and create characters that are yours, but but something else as well. I had a lot of fun watching Firefly Lane uh, with my girlfriends. And with the Nightingale, we, you know, I get asked all the time, what's going on, what's going on? And I don't know. We actually were ready to start production in March of 20. And they were shut down because of COVID. And then there was the writer's strike and the um, actor strike. So hopefully we're gearing up now to, you know, to film the Nightingale in 2024, which would be amazing. And yeah, I'm really excited about the women at Warner Brothers because I think it's just such, um, I think it's just such a powerful historical story and we haven't seen it before. And I do think it's important, you know, there are so many more women in the military now, women in combat, women fighting um, to do things that are so traditionally male. And I think when we have movies like this that show women uh, doing it, rising to the level and dealing with the same kinds of issues that men do, it really reinforces the idea of community. And, you know, so much of our world right now is divided. And I think if we can just, you know, come together um, and understand and empathize with each other more, um, we'll remember what it is we have in common instead of what separates us. You were an attorney before you became a writer or you were always a writer. We'll put it that way. What how did you make that leap? You know, when did you decide this is the this is where my life is going to go? Well, that's kind of a long and, and convoluted story, but the, the quick version is that um, I was in law school when my mother was dying of breast cancer. And so, you know, I was in the hospital with her a lot. And at one point we were we were talking and I was complaining about something about law school. And she said, well, you know, honey, don't worry, you're going to be a writer anyway. And I really had no interest in it. I had never even taken a creative writing class, but I was a huge reader. And of course, we mothers know our children incredibly well. And I think she saw that. And so she said, well, you know what? We should write a book together. And so we started imagining this. Um, it was a historical romance, actually, because that was her favorite kind of book. And so after school, I would go to the library and just do all this research and bring all these Xeroxed pages back to the hospital. And we sort of imagined this book together. And um, then after she passed away, I put it all in a box and put it in my closet and, you know, went on with life and passed the bar and started practicing. And it wasn't until years later when I was pregnant with my son and I had a difficult pregnancy, so I was on bed rest from week 14 on. And um, this was the late 80s. There was nothing to do, no television that was on, you know, during the day that was great. All my girlfriends and my husband were working. And so I thought, well, how about this book? And so I pulled, here comes this box that's like a gift from my mom. And I thought, well, I've got all this time. And by now I knew that I probably wouldn't be able to have any more children and I really wanted to be an at-home mom. And so I thought I will try writing. And if I can, you know, if I can sell something by the time um, first grade rolls around, it'll be a job. And otherwise it will be, you know, a great hobby. And so that's what I did. I just sat down and, and started writing. And I sold my first book when my son was two years old. Wow. And here we are. And here we are. <laughs>
And what what advice would you have for women who might be at a crossroads and might be thinking, hey, you know what? It might be time for me to move on to something else at a big juncture in my life, uh, becoming a mother. I mean, I think what it comes down to is we have to choose to be fearless and we have to not be afraid of our ambition, you know, um, and whatever it is, I think that you dream of doing, it's my personal belief that you aren't sort of given a dream without the skill set somehow to make it happen. Um, but that doesn't mean it's going to be easy. That doesn't mean you aren't going to have to sacrifice a lot. Uh, but my best advice is if you dream of something, begin to do it. You know, you can waste years thinking, boy, I wish I were a writer. Or I wish I were an artist, whatever it is. Um, you have to begin because things, uh, good things take time and you have to learn and you have to struggle and you have to persevere and you have to, you know, be determined. I wrote the first four novels, I think, that I wrote during nap time. You know, so when I put my son down, I ran out and started writing. And of course, that meant that I probably wasn't grocery shopping. I probably wasn't, you know, getting the laundry done. There were probably all kinds of other things that I wasn't doing. But I just made the commitment that that time was for me. And I was going to devote it to something that both fulfilled me and and and, and in which I glimpsed a future that I wanted. How has your role as a mother influenced your work? Uh, well, I mean, motherhood, sisterhood, friendship, um, the, the female journey is really what I've been writing about, you know, from the very beginning. Earlier in my career, I wrote, when I was a young mother, I wrote about young mothers and and holding marriages together and keeping your kids safe. And, you know, one of my biggest um, contemporary novels was about uh, the year your child is a senior in call, a senior in high school and the partying and the drinking and, and trying to, to navigate what felt like an incredibly dangerous and fraught landscape. And so I've been, you know, dealing with women's issues forever because that's, it's who I am, it's who my friends are, it's what I care about. And I just find our lives such rich, dramatic territory. So The Women is out now by the time this podcast will be available <laughs> wherever you normally get your podcasts. So Kristen, is there anything else you want readers to know, you want people to know as they delve in uh, to your latest work? Well, thank you for having me. This has been just a great conversation. Um, I guess I just want, um, you know, people to love the book and love Frankie and and learn something uh, the way I did, because I really think it's one of those books that you can't put down and you can't always know exactly where it's going. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's a really fun, even though difficult reading experience. I have to say, just like The Nightingale in a lot of your books, you get to a point in this book where you will, literally will not be able to put it down. I think I got through like 200 pages. That was like the same with The Nightingale. Once you get to a certain point and everybody yep. knows it, you're like, I'm not putting this down till it's done. And that was the same thing with this for sure. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, women can be heroes too. The Missing, The Forgotten, The Brave, The Women, um, out now by Kristen Hanna. So Kristen... Thank you so much. We'll have to have you back the next time you have. I would love out. that. Thank you. If I get a new idea, I'll, I'll be back. Awesome. Thank you so much. We appreciate it.